Well, hello. Um, our first lecture uh, is going to be about the pre-Socratic philosophers. Um, this is, we, historically, these are the earliest philosophers. There will be no essay questions on this, just discussion. You need, please post under discussion on this. Um, this is kind of a laundry list. I know that it's, we don't know very much about these characters. So I'm just gonna tell you the information that we know. Um, I don't like the term pre-Socratics. I don't think it does justice to these guys. They're pretty interesting characters. And, and the fact that we don't know much about them is kind of frustrating because they have some really interesting ideas and um, it makes you wonder how they came up with those ideas and we don't know because we, we only have snippets of information about these guys. But any, anyhow, so I'm just gonna start walking through um, these guys that you see on the screen and giving you uh, some of the inf some information about each one of them. I hope you find them as interesting as I do. All right, so start, Thales is the first person. Um, these, all these dates, and they're all dates, by the way, I didn't put BC in front of every one of them, but they're all dates. So Thales was about 640 BC. He's generally considered the first philosopher ever. Um, all right, so what's these famous for? He is famous for saying that everything is made out of water, um, which is not correct, of course. Uh, there's a, all right, so there's a couple of things to say about this. Um, first, the first thing is why is he considered a philosopher and, and uh, why is it, what is the significance of this? Well, look, it, it, in this time that we're talking about, over 2,500 years ago, long time ago. In this time, people uh, attributed everything to gods, deities, spirits, you know, everything was magical. And he actually came up with an answer to the question, what is everything made out of, which had nothing to do with gods or spirits or anything like that. It was a earthly, mundane answer to the question. Um, so that's a major break from the kind of superstitious mindset of the people at that time. And that is kind of why people, well, that is why people uh, think of him as being the first philosopher. Um, I would point out secondly that the answer water is not a crazy answer at all. I mean, water is one of, I think it's the only thing that appears in nature in all three states, ice, liquid, steam. Um, well, there's four states, but the, uh, it, it appears in three states, uh, solid, liquid, and gas. And you know, it's, it, it, it is not so much the answer to the question um, as much as the question itself that is intriguing. Um, yeah, water is not the right answer, but he's the first guy that looked around the world and said, hey, I wonder what everything is made out of. That's a huge question, which we are still working on trying to resolve. I mean, we've got it down to subatomic particles and things at this point, but I, it made a lot of progress on this answer. But I mean, the guy deserves credit for raising the question. That's the key thing here. He raised that question. And that is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, there are other things that are interesting about Thales. Uh, he is said to have introduced geometry from Egypt. Um, yes, uh, Egypt was far more advanced in geometry than Greece. All these guys are Greek. I should note that. These are all Greek uh, uh, philosophers. And it's called pre-Socratic also because it's be, um, uh, before Socrates. That's, that's the only reason they call it that. Um, Anyways, yeah, when they, built, when they built the pyramids, they weren't guessing. 
they had geometry in Greece. So he brought geometry, uh, or they had geometry in Egypt, and he brought that to the Greek world. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, uh, what do I want to say? There are some crazy, he's very, very, he was very, very famous in the ancient world. And there's all sorts of stories told about him. Like he was wandering around, staring at the stars and fell in a well. There's a famous story, but maybe likely not true. Just the, the way people <laughs> kind of characterize philosophers. The other thing I'd like to mention about Thales though, is that his, his uh, astronomy is really interesting. This guy actually had a really good understanding of astronomy. I mean, look, they thought Apollo was flying a freaking chariot across the sky. And he thinks that um, the, that he's got this picture with the sun and the, and the earth and the moon, and the phases of the moon are caused by the earth getting between the sun and the moon. And he even predicted an eclipse where he said the moon got between the sun and the earth. Um, this is disputed a little bit. It just seems crazy that he could even do that at that time. But there's so much, uh, there is just so much, so many accounts of this happening. It was, it was such a famous thing because there was a opposing uh, city-state. This is in Western Turkey that he lived. It was Greek at the time. And, um, so this army was going to invade his city, and he said, if you don't back off, I'm going to blot out the sun. And there was an eclipse. So that's that that accounts for the fame of the story. It's just, there's a lot, a lot of people retold that. So it seems like it might really have happened. Um, anyways, he's an inter interesting guy. Let's talk about Anaximander. He was a friend of Thales, so he lived in the same place in Western Turkey. Uh, he didn't like Thales' water idea, though. He thought that it has to be something more subtle, I guess. And he didn't really specify what that was, that everything is made out of, but he decided it had to be infinite, indestructible stuff, um, which is pretty vague, but, you know, he's thinking that it can't be something as coarse as water. It's got to be something more subtle. Um, he is credited with inventing the sundial in Greece. This is, the sundial was probably invented independently all over the world, but he gives, he does have that kind of credit. Um, he actually, I think the, the, one of the most interesting things, or probably the most interesting thing about Anaximander is he, he started to talk about what causes change as in like cause and effect in the world. And he thought that was uh, the result of opposites interacting, things like heat and cold. So opposites would come into um, conflict with each other and that that's what caused change in the world. Again, not a really big question. So it's not so much the answer as the question. Again, it's, um, it's, you know, what is everything made out of? That's Thales. What causes change in the world? And not, it's not Zeus or whatever. Opposites interacting, hot and cold, uh, wet and dry and things like this, opposites. Okay. Um, all right, you, a couple other things just to throw in there. He, he said human beings came from fish, which actually is, sort of true because all life began in the ocean um how he came up with that idea who knows um his astronomy was not good he thought that the earth is a is inside of a cylinder and that the heavens outside the cylinder were on fire and there's there's holes in the cylinder that that's what when we're looking through the these holes and we see the stars and the moon moon and the sun and an eclipse is caused when one of the holes gets plugged up. Uh, it's imaginative. Completely wrong, but imaginative. Um, he also believed that wind causes lightning, which, of course, is not true either. But, you know, um, it's a, 
that's a long way from Zeus throwing thunderbolts, which was what everybody else thought, right? Okay, um, now a student, a student of his, that is Anaximander student, is Anaximenes, same place, um, Western Turkey. Um, and he actually kind of thought that Thales was more on the right track maybe, because um, he thought that everything is made out of various uh, air in various states, I guess. And so, because air is the most, he thought air is the closest thing to being something immaterial. Again, kind of, I guess, siding with an Anaximander that it's more subtle than water. Um, but at least more substantive, you know, it's not just stuff, it's air. Um, he, his, his most interesting thing that he ever came up with for sure is that he um, posited, put forward the idea that compressed matter is cold and relaxed matter is hot. That is nuts because that's, if you've ever taken a you know, chemistry physics class, hey, that's what happens, you know? When uh, matter is cold, it, conden it compresses, it condenses. And when matter is hot, the, the atoms start moving faster and it relaxes. He's right. <laughs> Very interesting that he, he came up with this notion and he thought that accounted for change. So as opposed to opposites interacting, he thought it was compression and, and refraction that caused change in matter. Um, all right. He also thought that earthquakes were caused by the, the ground drying out. Um, well, and not true, you know, it's not that every time we'd have a drought, we'd have an earthquake, no. But again, not um not a mythological superstitious answer i mean he's trying to come up with something that's more uh earthly and mundane on this uh rainbows are caused by the sun meeting condensed air that's not correct either but not that far from the truth i mean again this is getting close um one interesting idea that uh, Anaximenes came up with is that infinite worlds exist. That's a pretty deep idea. Man, that's a pretty crazy idea. Infinite worlds idea, uh, exist. Um, I mean, that's a pretty deep thought, particularly at the time, you know. Um, I have an allergy attack again. Um, all right, so let's move on to Pythagoras. my nose a little bit here. Sorry. I just cannot get through a whole video without having an allergy fit here. Um, okay, let's move on to Pythagoras. Everybody knows Pythagoras. You've all know, you've all met Pythagoras. You all know who he is. The Pythagorean theorem. You know, I, I hope you've got that in one of your math classes by now. Uh, and yes, he came up with that. What's what's uh, what's lesser known? That's I think he should be. Uh, I I don't understand why he doesn't get credit for this as often. Is that he came up with the idea of notes and scales and keys and music. So he kind of came up with music theory. Pythagoras is a pretty interesting character. Um, he was born in a, on a small island called Samos off the coast of Turkey. Um, so not far away from the other guys that we just discussed, the other three. But, um, but he actually moved from, from Samos to Italy, southern Italy, um, which was also Greek at the time. Uh, Greece, the influence of the Greek uh, culture was more expansive back then than it is now. Um, and he actually took control of a town um, and founded a whole religion, a whole cult, the cult of the Pythagoreans. It lasted for like a thousand years maybe even more. So he was a very influential guy. Um, founded this cult, this religion that lasted for, that's a long time, like a thousand, 
1,500 years into Roman times. Um, his whole, and the whole thing revolved around numbers. So, you know, he did the Pythagorean theorem. And by the way, if you don't know music theory, it's totally about numbers, all right? So it's, it's mathematical. And he thought that numbers were the key. I've heard people, actually, I've heard people say, I, and I want to point this out, but I've heard people say that Pythagoras thought that the universe is made out of numbers. That's not, I don't think that's really accurate when you really read through the things that Pythagoras and his followers have to say. It's more like numbers are the key to unlocking the universe. I mean, you need numbers is how uh, you use numbers and math to understand the universe. Um, and so uh, he says that, well, first of all, he believes that numbers are real things, um, which is interesting. Um, ontological question and they had there's there's various uh beliefs that are encompassed and everything is defined by threes he thought that the stars movement in the in the heavily the movement of the stars in the heavens was musical ever heard about the music of the spheres that's pythagoras that's that's his idea um and if it's musical, then it's mathematical, right? Um, so everything is harmonious. The universe is harmonious. It's, it's, it's guided by these mathematical principles. He believed in, in that harmony of the universe. Um, he thought 10 is the perfect number. And, and he always, uh, he thought about opposites like um, love and hate and even male and female and good and evil and all these things related to odd and even. Um, his astronomy, back to astronomy again, was also exceedingly interesting and way before it, <laughs> way ahead of its time. He thought that in the center of the solar system, which you would have called the cosmos, that's the Greek word, um, is a big giant fire and all and the earth, which by the way, is a sphere. Pythagoreans believed that the earth is a sphere and Pythagoras believes that the earth is a sphere, it's not flat. This is 500 BC. Um, and the earth, the sphere that's the earth goes around this big giant fire. In other words, he had, he had a heliocentric, the sun is the center of the solar system idea way back then. It's 1500 years before Copernicus. I mean, this is crazy. Uh, this guy actually not only believed that the earth was a sphere, but that, uh, that it circled the sun. Um, ideas that did not catch on, I guess you would say, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, believe, and remember, he has a cult that lasted a long time. So, I mean, a lot of followers that believe these, these principles. Um, let's see. He also believed that the morning star is the same thing as the evening star, which a lot of people thought they were different. Um, it's, it's Venus, they're both Venus, so he's right. The, the morning star is the evening star, seen at different times of the year. Uh, he believed in reincarnation, which is kind of interesting for a Greek. Um, and by the way, if you're a Pythagorean, you're not allowed to eat beans or drink wine. And for that reason, I probably would not have been a Pythagorean. But anyways, he, it, I, I throw that in there to point out there are it is, it is a cult, and there are sort of religious beliefs involved in this. Um, but it's centered around numbers, okay? And, and numbers can unlock the keys to the universe. Let's move on to Anaxagoras. 500, approximately 500. These are all very approximate dates, by the way. Okay, 500 BC. Um, it's said that, he, that uh, a famous... Athenian a statesman um, named Pericles, which we might hear mentioned 
and some of these lectures about, um, about ancient Greece. He invited him to Athens, so he lived in Athens most of his life. Um, very interest. This guy is also a very interesting character. Listen to this and tell me what it reminds you of. He says, all things in the universe began in infinite, infinite smallness. And ever since then, it's been expanding outwards. Is that not the Big Bang Theory? There's no bang, but... Whoa! How did this guy come up with this idea? Everything began in infinite smallness, and the universe has been expanding ever since. Anyways, because of this, he thinks that there's a little bit of everything in everything. I guess if everything was all infinite smallness at once, there's a little bit of everything and everything, except for mind, and that's why I put noose. Noose is, the word noose is the word Greek for mind. And the one, one thing about Anaxagoras, he's, he thought that there is a mind, and don't think of like a person mind, like some kind of godlike or spiritual-like mind um, that's controlling this expansion in, in, of the universe and controlling how the universe functions. So he believed that there was mind controlling all the changes and exp expansion of the universe. Um, he said that nothing comes into being or perishes away, but only mixes and separates. That is, nothing comes from nothing. You will hear philosophers using that phrase, nothing comes from nothing, until the 1800s. It's like a mantra that everybody uh, uses, that nothing comes from nothing. That is to say, nothing just springs out of nowhere, um, and, just, and nothing perishes away, really. I mean, it just changes into something else. Um, I mean, it's very much and very similar and probably and very related to the conservation of matter. I mean, uh, matter doesn't go away; it just changes into something else. It's, it is it, that scientific principle is pretty pretty much the same thing as the idea of nothing comes from nothing, but very famous and lasted forever. And you'll hear it in everybody everybody's philosophy uh, when you read through the ages. Um, I should remark that when Anaximander said infinite, indestructible, and immortal stuff, uh, that idea is kind of implicit in this. I mean, if, if everything's infinite and indestructible and immortal, then it's the same stuff changing all the time. So um, it's sort of implied there. But when Anaxagoras says nothing comes from nothing, he... Uh, that's a that's a philosophical principle that you'll see all like I said into the 1800s. Um, let's see, um, mind controls motion and change in the universe. Or I mentioned that. Um, he said the sun is a stone and the moon is made out of earth. Uh, I'll remark on that because you'll see it when you read the first reading, which is the Apology. Uh, yeah, it's attributed to Socrates, but it's not Socrates. That was actually Anaxagoras who said that. He believed there is no such thing as a void, empty space, which I, I think that there is, a, there is a, such a thing as a void, empty space, but it's interesting that he's even considering that question. Again, pretty, pretty fascinating that he's even thinking about that. Um, how about some of these things, though? This... <laughs> Man is the most intelligent animal because he has hands. That is crazy. I mean, there is still de debate in anthropology about how man, you know, human beings evolved. Um, but you know, one of the one of the contenders and one of the things that's always being considered is not so much hands, but the opposable thumb. Man is the most intelligent animal because he has hands. That's pretty, how about plants breathe? How did he come up with, I mean, plants don't literally breathe, of course, but they take in carbon dioxide and release oxygen 
photosynthesis. Um, but the whole idea that plants breathe is pretty crazy. Um, the moon has mountains and valleys. That one, I, 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 that one seems, you know, when I look at the moon, I kind of seems like that to me. But a lot of people thought that the moon was a perfect sphere, Aristotle in particular. Thunder and lightning are caused by heat meeting cold. Um, not exactly right, but that's, that's not, that's pretty close. That's pretty, that's pretty close, right? That's pretty close to the, that, what is actually happening. Um, how about seeing is a reflection in the eyeball? <laughs> hearing, hearing is caused by a, a sound, by sound striking a bone in your ear? He's pretty interesting, all right. Pretty remarkable things he came up with. How he came up with, how did he figure that out? I wished I knew. Um, okay, let's talk about Parmenides and Heraclitus. These guys are a couple of uh, uh, diametrically opposed points of view. Um, Parmenides um, was in, influenced by Pythagoras, by the way. Um, and a guy named Xenophanes. Um, we have some of his actual, his actual writing, which is helpful because uh, when you read it, then you kind of get a feel for what the heck he's trying to say. He says, there's the true and then there's men's opinions, which are all false. He says, being is, and it is impossible for it not to be. You cannot even speak of non-being. Being has no beginning, and it is indestructible, universal, existing alone and as one. Everything absolutely is or is not. There's no generation or destruction. The universe is unmoved. That's why I put down the words no change. There's no change in the universe. We think that the universe is changing around us, but we're wrong. Those are men's opinions, and they're all wrong. Everything absolutely is or is not. There is only there is no change in the world. It's all gonna, it's it's an it's an illusion for, that we think so. Uh, he says, men's opinions of things arise and perish, and we give them names, but they're all wrong. Um, so nothing in the universe changes. This is kind of a seemingly crazy notion. Um, more contemporary philosophers have criticized uh, Parmenides. He, they think that what he is getting confused about is actually just language. He's getting tied up in language because he's getting tied up in the word, like, is getting totally mixed up with the word is. There's two, the, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is, as President Clinton said famously once. Um, there, there are certainly, there is certainly more than one meaning of the word is, and there's the is of attribution. So the door is wood, right? So you're saying that it belong, you know, that's um, that's one type of is. But there's also when you say, well, that is the way it is. That's just saying it exists. That's the, that it is, it exists. And so there's, there's certainly two meanings of the word is. And a lot of philosophers these days think that, um, that Mr. Parmenides just got confused and he thought that is, the is of existence is the, is the same thing as the is of at, attribution. So look, the door is either blue or it's not blue and is it either exists or it doesn't exist. And that would be a, that would be a logical mistake to say that. Um, and perhaps that is true. Maybe that led him into thinking everything absolutely is or is not like is, is a, it's like being, 
blue. <laughs> it is or it isn't. Um, and so it can't be anywhere in between. So everything either exists or it doesn't, and there's no change. Um, I would like to mention that uh, there's no way, there is no way in the world that Parmenides could have conceived of this the way, um, but when you look at modern science, physics, uh, we think in terms of space-time these days, space-time. Space and time are the same thing. And space-time is one big thing. And we're moving through space-time. So we perceive change. But space-time doesn't change. Space-time is one thing. The freaking guy might have been right. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Uh, given our current understanding of the universe, he may have been correct. Now, kind of the opposite of him is a guy named Heraclitus. He's most famous for saying that you can never step in the same river twice. Um, what is that supposed to mean? Well, the river's flowing and is changing every moment. And the general idea here is there is no, nothing constant. Nothing, nothing stays the same. Everything is changing all the time in the universe. So there is nothing constant, nothing that ever remains the same. Everything is changing all the time. And so Heraclitus always uh, is constantly emphasizing change and also relativity because he thinks that everything is relative. Um, so he says the sun is new every day, constant change. Asses prefer straw over gold, everything's relative. Pigs like mud more than clean water, everything's relative. <laughs> okay, um, so everything's changing and everything's relative. Um, he actually, uh, I could have put down fire here because he actually, uh, he didn't think everything's made out of fire, but he thought fire was a, uh, a good metaphor for the, for the way the world is because fire, you know, it's constantly flickering and changing, you know, <laughs> so what a good, what a good metaphor for um, the constant flux of change in the universe. Um, all right. We have some of his writings too. They're, they're called Heraclitus dark sayings. Um, dark because they're hard to make out what the hell he's talking about, that kind of dark. Not, they're not depressing, they're just, they're hard to figure out what he's talking about, that kind of dark. Um, okay, he says, the way up and the way down are one and the same. These are one of his sayings, make, make of it what you will. I like this one, um, a man's character is his fate. One of the other things he says, and this is this actually is this is kind of important to note, is that nature loves to hide. Um, Heraclitus didn't think that nature was absolutely chaotic and crazy. He thought it was changing all the time. Um, but nature loves to hide, and what he means by this is, yes, there is a logos, is what he calls it. That is a logic to the changes in nature. It's just that people rarely, if ever, know what that is. So he didn't think it was some chaotic random thing. He thought there was a logic to it. It's just that people really couldn't figure it out. At least not generally people couldn't figure it out. For us, it seems mostly chaotic and crazy. Um, so he did believe there is a logos. That is a logic. Logos is the Greek word for logic among other things. I'll talk about that later. Okay, um, let's get to the other couple of guys here. Empedocles. Empedocles uh, was from Sicily, which was Greek at the time again. Um, it's, it's part of Italy now. Um, he was supposedly a, re revered as a god. Um, all right. Um, <clears throat> he uh, 
he believed that change was caused by love and strife, which is what I put up there, which is kind of more like attraction and repulsion. It wasn't like an emotional thing. It's like things are attracted together and other things repulsed each other. You know, we know about him mostly from Plato. Um, and here's the thing that really is interesting. He has this crazy, crazy story about in the beginning of the world, the, the earth. So the gods created all the living creatures. And the way they did that is they just scattered, they scattered the entire earth with arms and legs and torsos and heads and body parts of all sorts of shapes and sizes and all kinds of crazy stuff. And these body parts joined together into all kinds of wacky ass animals. <laughs> You know, just all kinds of crazy things. Things with two heads and four legs and all kinds of crazy, crazy combinations of, of body parts. And as these creatures wandered around the earth, most of them died out because they could not survive in their environment. And what we have left is the creatures we have now. They survived and everything else died out because they could not adapt to their environment. Sound familiar again? Way crazy story, but it's survival of the fittest. I mean, it freaking just is. By the way, and Darwin mentions this guy <laughs> in the origin of species and he says way back in the you know 20 you know 500 bc empedocles came up with this idea of survival of the fittest it's right it's it's a crazy mythological story but it's like i said these guys are pretty fascinating pre-socratics you know really uh, i think they deserve a little bit more um, recognition, perhaps. Anyways, let's see. A um, couple other. So he thinks that hair and feathers and leaves and scales all have the same origin and things like these because, it, you know, they evolved from the same thing. Um, he has this idea that the soul is like a jar and an intemperate soul is like a leaky jar. Just note that because that's his idea. You'll see that in the Gorgias. Um, his, he also has this notion of effluences that, that um, um, account for how we see things, which is kind of like an ether, and that's in the Mino. Obviously, Plato read, the, or read and knew about this guy's works. Um, let's see. The taste of fruits is due to the soil it's grown in. I think there probably is some, I'm not a farmer, but I think there's some, maybe some truth to that. Okay, anyway, the air is set in motion by sound and strikes some, when it strikes something hard, it causes an echo. He also, by the way, believed in reincarnation. All right, one final guy, um, Democritus. Um, Democritus um, was from Thrace, which was um, Northern Greece. Um, he was a student of a guy named Lysippus, who knows, uh, Democritus gets all the credit, who knows what, <laughs> maybe Lysippus, these are all Lysippus ideas, who knows. Um, he did go to, he did actually go to Athens, uh, and by the way, if you look at the dates, this is not really pre-Socratic at all, it's during Socrates' time. He could have yet actually met Plato and Socrates, maybe did, who knows. Anyways, his idea, was that rather than water and air and fire and earth, oh, by the way, I, sorry, I almost missed that. Empedocles added earth to the, and came up with the four elements theory, which is, was prevalent forever, you know, that is water, air, fire, and earth. The four states of matter represented there. Um, fire is plasma. So there are four states of matter. And Empedocles kind of, we've already had three, you know, water, air, and fire. 
and he had a dirt. Um, Democritus th though took a uh, he took an exception to that, and he decided that no, um, what the what everything is made out of are infinite uncuttables um, in the void of space. Now, um, uncuttables uh, that kind of gives you an idea of where he's how he's even thinking about this. So, I mean, he's kind of thinking, take something, a stick, you know, whatever, pick a pick at something and start cutting it in half and 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 cut it in half some more. And at some point, you can't cut it in half anymore. And he thinks that's what everything's made out of, these things that you cannot cut in half. And they'll be so small that no human sense could detect it, tiny little things in the void of space. Now, what is the Greek word for uncuttable? Atom. Atoms. He believed the world is made out of atoms. Uncuttables. That's what atoms means. Everything is made out of atoms. The, your body and your soul, by the way, which makes him a materialist because he doesn't believe the soul is some kind of he thinks that's matter too. They're, the soul is atoms. Um, and he also didn't believe in freedom of choice uh, because he thinks everything is determined by these atoms interacting the way that they do. And we have no, we have no uh, input on how that works. The atoms just do what they do. And we think we have free choice. We are, are able to have freedom to make decisions and such. But we don't really. The atoms are doing... It's just the atoms, just interacting the way they interact. It's, it's an illusion for us. Um, let's see. He thought that there were innumerable worlds of different kinds. So kind of the idea that Anaximenes had there. Um, everything happens by necessity. There is no randomness. There is no... Uh, there's no freedom, but there's also no randomness because everything is happening by the necessity. It's just these inner, these little atoms just, you know. And the way he thinks of these atoms, even though we can't perceive them, he thinks that it's it has to do with their shapes. That's kind of the way he thought of these. Um, they, they are always bumping into each other and sometimes they'll break in part and sometimes they'll cling together. Um, things that are more ethereal, I guess you would say, or he would he conceives of these as being more cylindrical atoms like fire um, or your, or mind actually is another thing he uses there. And things that are like metal or rocks or something, they're more jagged and so they stick together more. You know, this is his idea. Um, one thing to note though is this is a very, he's a very much a skeptic. Um, that is to say, all right, the word skeptic means that you don't know very much. If you're skeptical about something, you don't um, believe it, I guess. If you're a skeptic, you don't believe that human beings know much at all. I mean, you're saying that you're skeptical of all human knowledge, generally speaking. A lot of skeptics in philosophy. Uh, well, not, not a ton, but we'll, we'll meet a few. Hume is another skeptic that we'll talk about later. Um, but he's a skeptic. He doesn't think human being, human knowledge is not worth very much because, hey, if all this is happening on this imperceptible level, um, we can't see atoms, and that's what's doing everything, controlling everything, then we don't really know very much. Makes sense, the way he, he thinks about this. All right, um, let me just sum up here to say that, okay, the pre-Socratics, I don't like the term pre-Socratics, like I said. I think pre-scientists, hey, I'm gonna go there. Um, these guys were never forgotten. I mean, they've been discussed throughout history for 2,500 years. And when people came up with, when Darwin came up with evolution, he remembered, or he, he knew about Empedocles. When, People were discussing the atomic theory. They knew about Democritus. Um, these guys, if they never were, they never existed, who knows if science would ever have existed? 
they had interesting ideas, by the way. Some are right, some are wrong, I know, and they didn't get everything right. Interesting how much they did get right and how interesting, I mean, the Big Bang Theory, natural selection, and um, the sound is a, is, is, <laughs> hearing is caused by sound hitting a bone in your ear, your eardrum, by the way, and crazy how much they got right. Um, but you know, it, it's it's about the it's they're asking these questions that drove scientific inquiry in the future. Um, so they're really, um, I you know, they're pretty fascinating guys. I think so. Anyway, um, let's see what you have to say, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>